Okay, so, so this session is uh, getting started with um, data set encryption. So this is really a guided tour, so this includes kind of two elements where we're going to talk through a little bit of how, what things that you need to th that you want to think about as you're setting up your environment for data set encryption. And then we're going to give you a demo just showing you how to actually encrypt the data set, which is pretty easy um, once someone shows you. So. <laughs> I can do it in minutes. It's piece of cake. In fact, I can do all the steps of configuring ICSF and RACF and SAF and data set encryption in about mm, 15 minutes. If I'm not if I'm talking, if I'm not talking, it's going to be even faster. So, it's pretty cool. So, a uh, little about me. Um, if you don't know me already, um, I've been at IBM for about 15 years, and I've always been in the ZOS Security Development Organization. So, I've jumped around to different teams in the organization, but I've always been in ZOS Security in some way or another. I actually started out on the RACF team, so I was on the team with Mark Nelson back there. Then I, I, I left them, went over to the Java crypto team because I needed some help and I wanted to learn something new. I love Java. Uh, and then after that, the ICSF team needed a little bit of help, and I was like, okay, well, let me jump over that. So I was kind of my first maybe three or four years at IBM, I just kept jumping from like team to team to team, which was good because it gave me the ability to kind of see um, different aspects of ZOS security. However, when I got to this ICSF team, that team was everything that I did was everything was so complicated. It was lots of puzzles, lots of things to figure out. It was ridiculously complex, and that was the team I decided to stay on because it was so complicated, and I love puzzles. So I've been on the ICSF team for about 10 years now, still going. Um, I've worked on lots of projects, elliptic curve cryptography, PKCS11, um, I did crypto as a service, regional crypto enablement, bill level and cipher, crypto use statistics, and if there's some other line items that you know, you'll hear about coming out in the next release of ICSF. One of the big things I did a few years ago was from the IBM crypto education community. And the reason I created that community was because we need a lot of guidance to customers and IBMers about how to use this wonderful cryptographic technology. Um, we had lots of crypto, you know, development in hardware, firmware, software, there are solutions. There's so many different layers of cryptography. And I found that, you know, for me, it took me three or four years to really kind of get somewhat of a handle on it. But for others who may not be using it all the time, they see it every once in a while, maybe once a year they change their master key. They don't remember how they changed the master key a year ago. It's nice to have a place where you can go for resources so that you can really you know, stay abreast of what's new and also have reminders of those things that you did before. So the crypto education community is meant to be a place where you can get information about anything related to crypto. So I am, I call myself a crypto nerd. Some people will say crypto queen, but um, I prefer crypto nerd. Um, I, my current role, I serve as a crypto subject matter expert. So when people, customers, IBMers have questions about cryptography or pervasive encryption, um, key management, they usually reach out to me. Um, I'm also a ZOS ICSF developer when I can get to it. Uh, my main responsibilities are design and development, and I do crypto code samples, and I also help with crypto education and guidance and direction. So what we're going to do today, what this session is really based on, is data set encryption. How many people have heard of ZOS data set encryption? Hopefully everybody. How many people have not heard of ZOS data set encryption? Nobody. Okay, awesome. So you guys are in the right place. So the idea with ZOS data set encryption is really just one aspect of a bigger picture, which is called pervasive encryption. Pervasive encryption includes areas of you know, encryption of data at rest, data in use and data in transit. So we're talking about network, coupling facility, application level, database level, data set level, file level. We're talking about Linux. We're talking about ZOS, ZVM. We're talking about your disk and tape encryption, your hardware. So there's so many different aspects of pervasive encryption. And we're really right now just going to focus in on one of those, which is data set encryption. So I have heard that some people, when they talk about pervasive encryption, they kind of assume that we're only talking about data set encryption, and that's not the case. As you can kind of hear from before, it really is a number of technologies and capabilities that work together to give you pervasive encryption in your enterprise. So we're going to focus on data set encryption now. And what this really kind of takes you through is these 10 steps. And you might say, well, where did these 10 steps co come from? So I will flip really quick over to a wiki page. So here's a wiki page. Um, I created this last year. Um, I was tasked by, by Michael Jordan. He was saying, hey, we have all these customers. They need to know how to do data set encryption. We need to come up with an easy way for customers to be able to implement it. 
And so I said, okay, well, I already have this crypto education page, you know, or community. Why don't I go ahead and create a page designated to dataset encryption? And that's what this is. This page was actually designed for people who either have ICSF and crypto cards and they know what they're doing. And it's also designed for people who have not even heard of ICSF and they're trying to get started and they're trying to configure it. So this is a resource for everyone. It's designed in such a way that the steps on the left, one through five, these steps are for someone who does not have ICSF set up. So if you don't use ICSF today, but you would like to use Crypto Express cards, you need to configure ICSF, you need to load a master key, you need to initialize your CKDS, you're gonna do these steps, one through five. You're gonna do that generally for the most part, you're gonna do it once. Now you might rotate your key, you know, maybe once a year or, or once every couple of years. But generally these steps you kinda do once, you get everything configured, you get everything set up, and that kinda just stays and you're good. Now, when you're doing data set encryption, steps six through 10, you're gonna do these steps again and again and again. You're gonna be generating keys, you're gonna be protecting data sets, authorizing users, you're gonna be you know, writing data sets, you'll be verifying those data sets. These are the steps six through 10 that whether you're a new user or an experienced user, you're gonna be doing steps six through 10. Everybody will be doing steps six through 10. So during the demo portion today, I'm actually gonna take you through steps six through 10. In addition to that, there's also the concept of key management, which is the tricky concept. Everyone will tell you how easy it is to encrypt a data set, and you will see how easy it is to encrypt a data set. But the key management is usually that thing that kind of gets people, right? Key management is very important when it comes to data set encryption. Most of you guys know how encryption works, right? You supply you know, some clear text. You know what algorithm you want to use. You supply a randomly generated key. And then you produce ciphertext. In order to get the ciphertext back to the clear text, you have to supply whatever the original ciphertext was. You have to know the algorithm, and you have to have the key. So the key really is the important part. The key is really the security behind the encryption, right? So your keys must be protected, and they must be available. What happens if you lose a key? Will you ever be able to get that data back? No, you will not. You have to make sure that you protect your keys. You have to make sure that you have backups of your keys. Sometimes you have to have key rotation policies depending on what your auditors require or what regulations you have to follow. So it becomes very, very, very important that you manage your keys properly. So when you click on these links, all of these are links, they will actually take you to additional information. So if you click on this one, this will take you to a presentation on key management. If you click on this one here, it actually takes you to a sample Rex code that one, about cookies, okay. It will take you to a sample Rex code that shows you how to generate a key. For pretty much every step there, there's, you click on it, it will take you to some information that is useful. For most of these, it's either a Rex sample, it could be JCL, um, it may be a presentation. The idea is that, you know, for anything that you see that's a C-list, Rex, or JCL, they're meant for you to copy paste them and they have, you know, instructions at the top for how to go about using them. So these are meant for you to help you get started and you're supposed to be able to copy paste, tweak them to your needs, and then run them so you can get up and running very quickly and see you know, how to encrypt a data set. So please feel free to use this as a reference. Okay, but before we get to that point, let's go ahead and just kind of explain um, these different aspects of data set encryption. We're gonna look at three different perspectives here. So you have your ICSF view. That's the person who's your ICSF administrator. You have a DFSMS view. That could be either the data owner, that could be your storage administrator, there's questions that we're gonna ask around that view. And then there's your rack up view, that's your security person, your security administrator. Now depending on the size of your organization, you might have some of these roles like intermixed with each other or you might have distinct roles for different groups or different people. Um, regardless, you're gonna to wanna to think about these questions that I'm gonna ask as we go through these different steps. So step number one will be configuring Crypto Express cards. How many people have Crypto Express adapters? Yeah, some people got them. So everybody should get those Crypto Express adapters. Now you might say, well, why do I actually need Crypto Express adapters? What makes them so special? Can't I just do this with you know, clear keys? Well, it will not fail you if you use clear keys. I will not recommend using clear keys, um, but it will not fail. Um, what we do recommend strongly is to use Crypto Express adapters. You wanna know why? What is the most important, important aspect of encryption? The keys. the keys. Where do your keys live? Anybody know? 
Well, your keys can live in a variety of places. Typically for data set encryption, your keys are gonna live in a cryptographic key data set, CKDS. That's your key store. Um, and this, that key store is the one that's supported by ICSF. If you use SSL, then it would be a key database. If you use Java, there's a Java key store, which is just a flat file. You know, you have various key stores depending on the application you're using. For ICSF specifically, we store ours in a key data set. Our key data set is really just a vSAM data set, and we use a key label, which is 64 characters. We use that to look up the correct key in that key data set, which is awesome, right? Now, one of the things that you have with data set encryption, one of the reasons that we're doing data set encryption is because we want to protect our data, sensitive data, from different types of users. And now you have the ability to separate, you know, someone who's a storage admin who should have access to move data around, migrate, recover, things like that, but shouldn't be able to read like social security numbers or credit card numbers or things that are sensitive. Typically, you know, someone who has that, ador that authority, like a storage admin, would have operations authority. Would someone with operations authority be able to read the keys in your key data set? It's a vSAM data set. Yes, they would. If those keys are in the clear, who can see those keys? The person you're trying to keep from seeing your sensitive data. So if you're trying to have that separation, if you're trying to separate different users from being able to see sensitive data, you should inc inc include your keys as part of that sensitive data. Now with keys, you're not gonna encrypt your CKDS with, with data set encryption. That will give you all kinds of issues with chicken and eggs and yeah, you can't encrypt your key data set because that's where your keys live. You won't be able to open it if you, have, if you don't have the key. So, bit of a problem there. So, what you do is you encrypt those keys with what's called a master key. The master key lives on the Crypto Express adapter. So, that Crypto Express adapter is tamper responding. So you load the master key securely onto that adapter. That master key lives only on that adapter. And whenever you generate a key, your key is going to be encrypted with that master key. So as it sits at rest in that key store, it's protected because even if somebody goes and they extract the key out, it's useless to them because they can't decrypt the key because it's encrypted by a master key that they don't have access to. So that's the value of the Crypto Express adapter. Any questions on that? Okay. So. You're trying to configure your crypto express card. So the first question you might ask would be how many adapters are needed? Well, first of all, you generally have to have two at a minimum. Um, with the specific to data set encryption, you're going to want to have the CCA configuration. Um, so you start off with two and you can decide and you'll, in the future if you want to grow that, if you're doing a lot of operations and you see that, you know, your throughput, you know, you want things to go a little bit faster, um, you can add additional cards. And there actually is an article that's available here. That will give you some guidance on how to go about deciding when it's time to upgrade and get more cards. But you're going to want to decide how many cards you're going to need if you don't have them today. You're going to decide which adapters are going to be assigned to which LPARs. And you're also going to decide which modes are going to be configured. Like I said, if you're using data set encryption, you're going to need CCA mode. There are three different modes. And you need a CCA coprocessor for data set encryption because that's how you store and load your master key, your AES master key specifically. Another question is whether or not you need a TKE workstation. Well, a TKE workstation gives you just one means to load a master key. It is the most secure way to load a master key, but not everyone require, is required to use a TKE workstation. There are other ways to load master keys as well. But in terms of configuring Crypto Express, it's really your ICSF administrator who's going to ask these questions and think about those answers. Are there any questions on this? Okay. So this is just giving you just a sample screenshot of what it will look like if you're trying to configure those Crypto Express adapters. You're going to see lots of panels. You're going to see different domains. You're going to be deci uh, deciding whether or not, you know, this particular LPAR is associated with this domain <coughs> on the adapter, and you're going to be configuring them so that you can actually turn on crypto. And you're going to do that pretty much for every domain and or every LPAR. You guys kind of understand the concept of domains? Awesome. So yeah, basically on the, your Crypto Express, uh, just real quick on your Crypto Express adapter, you can have up to as many domains on the adapter as you have LPARs. What that means is that in each domain you can have your separate master key. So you can have one KEC, you know, and you have your two cards because you want to have redundancy. So you have your two cards, and each of and those cards you can say, hey, well, LPAR one or LPAR A is going to be associated with domain one, and they're going to have a unique master key. And then LPAR B is associated with domain two and it has a unique master key. Or you could say, you know, LPAR, LPAR C in domain three has the same master key as domain two. You can set that up too. 
So it is your choice to you know, decide how you want to segment out your master keys, and you can use that using card domains. So same card, you just have different domains for different LPARs. Okay, so now we got our Crypto Express adapter. So next step, you're gonna configure ICSF. So now when you look at configuring ICSF, you kind of have you know, two perspectives here. You have your ICSF admin has some work to do, and your security admin also has some work to do. So your ICSF admin is the person trying to figure out, okay, well, what key data sets do I need? Well, I kind of alluded to earlier is that you guys have to have a cryptographic key data set. A CKDS is required for data set encryption because that's where all your AES keys will be stored. Question is, will that key data set use the common record format? The answer should be yes. And you might be asking yourself, well, what is the common record format and what are the different formats? There are three different formats for the cryptographic key data set for the CKDS. The most recent one is common record format and it gives you the ability to hold metadata. Now you might say, okay, why do I need metadata? Well, there are some features like key archival, which are only supported with metadata. They're only supported with a common record format. Generally speaking, in terms of data set encryption, you never want to delete a key. So what do you want to do when you want to kind of expire a key but not really expire a key? Well, you can do things like key archiving, which basically marks a key as archived, but the key remains in your CKDS. So whether you do key rotation, no matter what your key management process is, that key is not deleted from the CKDS. It's just kind of taken out of play. If somebody tries to use the key, you can recall it back. You'll get an SMF record saying someone tried to use an archive key. It's the safest way to quote unquote delete a key. And it's the only recommended way we, we say to delete a data set encryption key. So we strongly recommend using common record format. Will any key data sets be shared in a sysplex with a common master key? Now this one's fun. How many of you guys have a shared CKDS in your environment? I see some hands raising. Well, why would you want to share a CKDS in environment? Well, let's say you have an environment where you have this LPAR, this LPAR, this other LPAR, and you're going to open this one data set, and that data set's available on all three LPARs. Well, in order to open that data set, the same key needs to be available to all those LPARs. What's well, an easy way to make sure you have the same key available on every LPAR? Share your CKDS. When you share your CKDS by turning on Sysplex communications, what that means is one update on one system is going to get propagated to the other systems. The way ICSF works is we actually, all of the keys themselves are stored in a vSIM data set. When we're running and kind of operating, doing the I.O. to the vSIM data set would take a lot of time. So we want to make things faster. For performance, we keep everything in memory. What that means is that if someone makes a change on one system, yes, it gets written to the vSAM data set, but the ICSF instance doesn't know because it's not going to read from it constantly. So in order to, for this system to know that that one made a change, there has to be a signal that gets sent across to all of the other members to let them know that a change has been made. And we only do that if you turn on Sysplex communications. So definitely recommend that if you're using CKDS uh, sharing. Other questions about auditing? These are just like kind of no-brainer yes questions. Do you want to turn on key usage auditing? Do you want to turn on life cycle auditing? Do you want to turn on crypto usage statistics? Those should all generally be yeses. Um, unless you're concerned about SMF records, then you can kind of turn it on, see kind of what you get, and then you can kind of manage it. But the idea is that you do want to have auditing. Your auditors are going to ask you how you're managing your keys. From the racket perspective, from your security administrator, you're going to first make sure that your ICSF admin can make changes to the prime mod member. If it's not the ICSF admin who makes the change, then it'll be a sysprog. But either way, you're going to have to make changes to your CSF PRM prime mod member for ICSF configuration. CSF serve and CSF keys classes should be active and rack listed. Always. They should be on. If they are not on, that means anybody in your system can access any key in any callable service for ICSF. You may not want random people going in and encrypting random things on your system. The CSF service, CSF class, is great if you have an active and rack listed. It also is great if you have a backstop, right? So you have a CSF keys splat, so that covers everything, um, with a UF of none. You want to make sure that no one has access to keys, no one has access to services, unless you explicitly permit them. Any questions? No. So here's a sample of CKDS allocation job, just so you can get a feel for what that looks like. Like I said, you want to use that common record format. Um, the common record format has an LRECO of 2048, so that's usually the way I kind of know which one it is. Um, when you define that job here, and I'm sorry, this should be shifted here, it moves every once in a while. But this name here, 
match with the name that goes in your prime life number for ICSF. So you're going to want to make sure that you have, let's see, let's see if I can do a pointer here. So you're going to want to make sure that this name here that you have when you're defining your VSIM data set matches the name that you see here for CKDSN. Here, Sysplex CKDS, this is where I'm turning on Sysplex communications. So in my environment, what's interesting is I only have a single system, so I don't even have any other members, but I'm going to turn on Sysplex CKDS anyway, so that way if, somehow, if I do decide that I want to add another member, then it's just going to come up and automatically connect the two. I don't have to worry about you know, stopping and starting ICSF to turn on Sysplex for this one that's already running. Um, other settings here, these are kind of defaults, the check off setting. I talked about, you know, statistics and turning on auditing. So all of those things. So this is kind of a sample of what you would have in your CSF PRM members for ICSF. So it's pretty straightforward, not a whole lot there. So after you have, you know, your prime live member configured, now you can start ICSF. When you start ICSF, you're going to check messages on the console. You're going to make sure that your Crypto Express adapters are showing up active. You're going to make sure your key data sets are showing up correctly. And you're also going to make sure that any of those options that you set, they're going to scroll across the screen. You're going to make sure that all of those look good as well. Just ask him, sub equals master, is there any, any other access to those error messages? I have gotten questions about that. I will take that as a to um, get back to you on that question. Because I know we've done some investigation on sub equal master because a lot of people are trying to start ICSF earlier in the cycle and sub equal to master makes that easier. But there was some concern about whether or not messages would go out to job log. Or, too, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so let me get back to you. You, ha um, you can either send me an email um, or we can talk after. Sure. Good question. Mm -hmm. No. No. <laughs> you will have different schools of thought on checkoff and how it should or should not work. Um, me and Greg Boy often have fun arguing about it at Vanguard and other sessions. Um, the default option is checkoff no. When you have checkoff no, that means that anyone who's an authorized caller, any calls through them, do not get checked for CSF, um, CSF keys, CSF serve. All those checks are bypassed. The reason is because you have some callers, you think the callers like DB2, the operations need to be very fast. You don't want every select statement, every insert to have a rack F call. It's too slow. And so for performance reasons, you would turn on check off no. Now the other school of thought is with check off yes is, well, what if you don't trust that authorized caller? Or what if it's a vendor product and you want to know what they're doing? There's that, that's the risk and that's the other side. So some customers do choose to turn on check off equals yes, because they want every call to have that rack F check. And then they only turn it off if they are concerned about performance. So the concern that was raised, I think, from Rack Delivery a while ago was the fact that the checks for the keys were being The checks from CSF, key, the checks in DFSMS for CSF keys, they, those are checked, always. So are always checked. So ignores the second check. The check, the check it, because basically that's happening outside of ICSF. Checkoff is only an ICSF um, configuration option, and the checks that DFSMS are doing are happening externally. So it does not um, apply to checkoff. The one that does apply to checkoff would be CSMBKRR. So when you actually do the key record read, that is a call into ICSF. And so if you have checkoff no, then that gets bypassed and you don't have to set up uh, permissions for, for the KRR class or resource. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay. So we got our parameters set up and then we're going to start ICSF. Start a task looks pretty, pretty simple and straightforward. You're just going to set up your parameters, you know, point to where your parameters live. And then when you start ICSF, you're just going to check and make sure that everything looks okay. There you can start seeing messages about your Crypto Express adapter. You can see messages about your CKDS. In our case, our CKDS is not yet initialized. We have allocated one, but we, don't have, we haven't put anything in it. So you're going to get the not initialized message. There's not, nothing wrong with that. You're going to initialize it later. Um, but it's just something that you'll see when you're first starting up if you don't have an initialized CKDS. So don't let any of that stuff scare you off. The really important thing is to make sure if you have Crypto Express adapters that they do say that they are active.
Okay, next up, you're gonna load your AES master key. So now that we have ICSF up and running, we wanna get our key data set out of that initialization step. We wanna get it initialized. So in order to do that, we need to load our AES master key and then we need to initialize our CKDS. So you have to think about when you're loading your AES master key, how you're exactly you're gonna do that. Um, are you going to use the master key entry panels? Or are you gonna use a TKE workstation? How many key officers are you gonna have? Generally speaking, you wanna have more than one key officer. You don't wanna have just one person that has your master key because that's your single point of attack, right? You can have two, three, or more key officers and each one of them have to come together and actually to, in order to produce the final master key. Um, you have to think about how those master key parts are gonna be stored. If you're using a TKE workstation, the answer is easy because the master key parts are stored on smart card. Each key officer has their own smart card with their own master key part. They each load in their master key part, they type in their PIN number, and that's how they authenticate and that's how their master key gets loaded. If you're not using a TKE workstation, then you would be using the master key entry panels. And from those panels, then you have to kind of, okay, we'll have this one user come in and then they generate their random number, they do their checksum, they load their key, they save it somewhere, and then the next person comes in and does the same process. They need to save that master key somewhere because in the future, if you get a new Crypto Express adapter or you're moving to a new box or it's a DR environment or something bad has happened, you need to be able to load that master key again so that your key, your key data set will become active. So you have to consider how you're gonna store that master key. Now you're not gonna put this on a sticky note on your computer. <laughs> uh, you're not gonna put it up on a whiteboard in your office. Uh, you're gonna make sure that you save it someplace securely. So these are some of the things you wanna think about in terms of master keys. Um, from the uh, administrator, from security, they're just making sure their ICSF admin has the access they need to do this. So really a lot of like the early steps as far as you know, setting up for data set encryption are really on the ICSF administrator and a little bit on the security admin. These are the three different ways that you can generate, maintain, and manage master keys. Um, like I said, the reason you have that check there is because the TKE is the most secure way to load a master key. If you don't have a TKE workstation, the next recommended way would be to use the master key entry panels. The downside with using master key entry panels is you can see your key value on the screen. That you will not get with TKE workstation. TKE does not show the key on the screen. So you have to be careful in your process that you don't have someone behind you, you know, taking a picture of you with your master key. No selfies with your master key in the background. <laughs> not a good idea. <laughs> um, PP init is not really recommended. Um, you can use it. It's, it's easy to use, but it's one person has the master key. Um, you can only do it once. You can't use it for master key rotation. I generally don't recommend people start with PPNN. I usually tell them if they don't have a TK workstation to use master key entry panels. At least it'll give you, you know, you'll have, you know, more than one key officer having their key part. It's not in the hands of one person. So it's more secure. After you have your master key loaded, now you can actually initialize your CKDS. What happens when you initialize your CKDS is we take that master key uh, create a hash from that master key, so it's an eight byte hash, and that eight byte hash gets stuffed into the header record of that CKDS. And from that point forward, every key that's generated as a secure key will have that hash, that MKVP, master key verification pattern, will be included in the key token, and it will be checked for validation every time you use that key. Because that key, that's in the, the master key that actually exists in the Crypto Express adapter, has to match the MKVP, which is in this header, and the MKVP, which is in the token itself. Now, so the question that some people have is, if I load my master key using the ICSF panel, doesn't that mean that my master key lives in ICSF? Anyone want to answer that? No, the answer is no. Um, just because you load the master keys through ICSF does not mean that the keys are actually gonna live in ICSF. They flow through ICSF to the Crypto Express adapter, but at the point that you've loaded that key on the adapter, ICSF no longer has that key. We don't want the master key. We don't want your master key in the host, in the operating system, in the application, in ICSF, or anywhere. That master key needs to live only on tamper responding hardware. <coughs> so what we have in ICSF is just this MKVP, this hash. And we use that hash as just a means of verifying that the value we think the master key should be matches the card, even though we don't have the actual master key in ICSF. So the only residual information about the master key that we have is this MKVP that we use to check and validate what's on the card. Does that make sense? So you, you're using that little bit of communication that all express adapters will get one master key on the parallel side that are shared environment? 
When you are loading a master key, the master key gets loaded on an individual domain. Sysplex sharing does not count for master keys. Yeah. But if I have a domain, you will, uh, I adding or changing the master key, IPSF will synchronize? Yes, the, yes. We have what's called coordinated change master key. You still will have to load the master key from every domain. You have to load them in the new master key register of each domain. But then once you actually kick off the change master key operation, it will make sure that every system's CKDS is updated. So all of them will have the re-enciphered keys, all of them will have the new MKVP. But you will have to make sure every individual LPAR has to be loaded with that master, the new master key, before you can kick off that operation. And that's also a, a defined task what happens when changing the hardware. Hmm? You sure do. If you get a new Crypto Express adapters, new machine, you will have to put those master keys into those new adapters. Okay. TKE That's makes it. T well, yeah. Huh? That's, That's the same thing for DR. In a yeah. DR environment, the same thing. You have new new machine, new adapters. You have to load the master key on those adapters, and you have to make sure every domain is loaded on those as well. Yeah, it has to be a match. And that's why a lot of customers use TKE Workstation because it has the ability to copy domain information from one to the other. So if you have lots of domains or lots of CACs, then it makes it easy for you to move that key, master key material from one domain and one card to another. Versus if you use the panels, which you can do, but then you have to kind of log on to every panel and you have to put in the master key. It's tedious, but not hard. Yes. Yep. Okay. okay, so the initialize for the CKDS, that's basically what I said. You take that, we don't want to keep the master key in ICSF, but we need some kind of information so we can do comparisons and validation. So we have the MKVP there. So this is the step for initializing a CKDS. It's pretty straightforward. You just give your CKDS name, hit number one. And then you'll see initialization complete, and you'll see messages telling you the master key is good. Okay, so the next steps, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So this is all going to be part of the demo. So what I'll do is I'm going to swap, 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 <laughs> swap switch. I'm going to switch over to the demo so we can just kind of, I'll kind of talk you through this. Um, you will have the slide so you can see some of these additional questions and things to consider, but I think it's more fun for you actually guys to, to see the demo. Let's switch out of here. Okay, so I have a lot of systems up, um, as you can see. Um, this is my normal environment, funny enough. Um, typically on my system, I'm just gonna do like a real quick check. ICSF, ICSF is up, the ICSF cards. Sometimes my system goes down if I don't use it for long enough. Oh, it's up, perfect, okay, great. <laughs> It's like if I don't like use it in a certain amount of time, there's like a timeout value and then I have to go and like start everything up. So I think we're good. Okay. So the first step that we're gonna do um, is we need to generate our key. So we need to generate in an operational key. This is different from the master key, right? The master key is the one that's stored on the Crypto Express adapter. The operational keys are the one that's stored in your key store or your CKDS. Now typically what I would do is, in my old, my old way of doing this, is I would run an AREC script. So we can take a real quick look at that. And these are the same rec scripts that are out there on that website that I showed you earlier. And the idea with the, the rec script is just give you, you know, a little bit of code to actually, you know, generate a key. Very easy. Um, I define a key label, as you can see here at the top. Um, I'm going to read and make sure the key doesn't already exist because if the key already exists, I don't want to override it. Remember, overwriting is just as bad as deleting because now you've overlaid the original key. So you always want to check and make sure you're not overriding a key. So if I have determined that the key does not already exist, then I can actually go and generate it. So if you've never seen ICSF code before, now you can say you have. This is all written in Rex um, scripting language. 
And with this is I'm generating a, an operational key. Um, this is key length 32, so it's 32 bytes, which, you know, multiplied by 8, that's your 256-bit key. And this is an AES data key type. Um, the other fields here don't really matter. The only one that, other, one that really matters is this one. I'm just giving you a buffer um, for my 64-byte key token. And then I'm going to, after I've generated the key, I'm going to store the key in the CKDS, and I'm going to read it out. So we'll go ahead and run this real quick. And here you can actually see on the screen, this is my key label. I'm actually going to copy that. Generally speaking, for dataset encryption, we only support AES 256-bit keys. That's it. Okay. So that's... Yeah, that's the only type of key. Okay. And it's sufficient as far in terms of strength. Like, what we look at is, like, the standards as far as, you know, key strengths go, and AES 256 <coughs> is considered one of the strongest symmetric keys. So what you see here is your CS secure key token comes out. You can see, I can, well, I can tell because I can read the bits and bytes, but there's information about the key token here. So you can tell what actual, what type it is, and there's information about the master key verification pattern, and then there's the actual key itself, that, which is in that key token. Now, that's one way to generate a key. There's another way to generate a key, which actually is much easier, but you have to have the new release of ICSF. So this is why I mentioned it during Mark's session. You want to have HR77 Charlie 1. There's a really cool browser that's available that makes your life easier. So if you're on the ICSF panel, so you go to option 5 for utility. Go to option 5 again for CKDS keys. And this is a completely new panel. This is supported for Charlie 1. And with this, you see now you can actually like list and browse and manage the keys that are in your key store. Now today I have one key because I just added it, right? So if I were to actually go do number 1 here, I can actually see that key that I just generated. If I type K, I can see the attributes of the key. I can see it was created today. I have no crypto period. I have no uh, key archival dates. I can actually see the service that was last used, KRR. It was used to read it. Um, it was not archived. So there's information about the key that you can see in here. You can also see the type of key it is, um, AES key 256 bit. So you can see all of this in this browser. So it's really useful. One of the nice features too is if you're getting started with data set encryption and you go to option seven, you can actually generate a key very easily. So if I want to generate number two, I can go in here, put the key label in, I hit S, hit enter, and now I have a key. That is the easiest way to generate a key. Now you see I have two keys in there. So this is a very easy way, you don't have to write any code, don't have to use Kega, nothing complicated. Now you may not want to have to do this if you have to create like 200 keys. This is not the, the way to do that. Um, you would use KGUP or utility that creates keys in bulk or, or code or EKMF or one of those tools. But if you're just creating one or two, you're getting started, I highly recommend using this feature. Okay, so now we have our key, which is awesome. So now that we have our key, we can actually go and protect a data set. So let's take a look at this one. I'm skipping past all of the instructions because I am your instructor and I wrote these, so I think kind of know what they do. <laughs> um, so first thing that we do here is we're actually going to define a resource. Um, SGG admin SMS allow data set encrypt with UAC of none. What that resource does is it's kind of a stop that says if you're not a security admin, you are not allowed to encrypt the data set. Now, for the most part, that is the IBM recommendation. The security admin is the one that should be the only one that should enc encrypt the data set. Generally speaking, this is a security feature, so your security admin should be in control. However, there are some environments where users may want to have SMS data class or JCL or DB2 or, or other things be able to um, say that they want to encrypt the data set. They want to be able to supply key labels and other means. If so, then you would have to permit them access to this profile. So after we do that, we create the profile, UAC of none, then I do a setter ops, uh, rackless refresh, and then an R list. Pretty much for every command in this C list, I'm going to do a, a list of some sort so you can actually see the output of the C list. 
Okay, so we got our first profile out there that says, okay, only security admins can encrypt data sets. Now the next thing we need to do is we need a generic data set resource to protect our data set. Because we're going to create a data set called isha.icsf.encryptme.data. And so I'm going to create a generic reset and anything that falls under that filter, under that category, is going to be encrypted with a particular key. So I create that data set and then I'm going to alter it. After I created that data set, I'm going to alter it. And when I alter it, I'm actually going to put in that key that we just generated. Actually, I can, since we have two keys, I can put in one or two here, but it doesn't matter. So here we have key one, which is in there. And what this means, any data set from this point forward after this has been executed, any data set which is allocated will have that key in its encryption cell. Anything that falls under that will have it. Now, if you had data sets that were protected by that, pro well, obviously this profile didn't exist before now, but if you had data sets that were protected by a profile and then you add the DFP se segment or data key segment after the fact, those data sets will not be encrypted because they were already allocated. It's only at the point of allocation time that the key label gets hardened to the data set. And once it has been hardened, it's stuck with it like forever. There's no creative way of migrating it off and recovering it to see if you can switch between one or the other. Once it's in that encryption cell, it's with that data set for life. The only way to you know, encrypt it with another key is to allocate a new data set with a new key and then copy the data over. So everything that falls on this category is gonna have this key. And we're just gonna kinda list out that. Okay, the next thing, this was controversial. This is actually a lot of fun emails with Mark Nelson and Bruce Wells and the RACF team about, hey, I want, this, I want this thing, I want to set up this profile and I want everybody to be impacted by it. I want everybody to be affected. Well, how do you do that? Well, then you have to refresh, you know, data set class. From what I've heard, this is a very bad thing to do in an environment where you have people up and running because now you have all these people that have like their own rack up spaces and they're all, you know, managing independently and they all have to come down and come back up, which is a bad thing. We, we, nothing comes down and goes back up. It's just Purged, okay. That's the word, ah, that's a good word. So yes, your caches are purged <laughs> and you start over. Um, so either way, this is a kind of do at your own risk. It's commented out. Um, it is the way to make sure that the change that you made is kind of you know honored everywhere. But as you said, it does purge everything. So it will slow down everything. It's banned? Banned, yes. Wow. Because people run scripts mm -hmm. changing uh, profiles, and once that was done, the random build the profile was created without an access list and the production system broke down. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's um, pretty important. There were several places obviously you can't do it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so at this point, we have our profile that says, okay, only security admins can create it, and we've added our key label to our data set profile. Um, and now we need some users. You know, we have a couple of users here. We're gonna add, we're gonna add a data owner, we're gonna add a storage admin. Um, do not ever use this password. <laughs> In fact, if we go out to that website, let's see, do I have number seven up? Allocate data set, this one, this one this one here we go out here and we go to the ad user notice you that password is not here huh it's change dash me now there are two problems with that anybody tell me why it won't work if I had if I if somebody accidentally copied and pasted and tried to run this well one it's more than like eight characters and then also it has a dash in it which also is not supported so there's no way that you could run that sample script and do the password that I have <laughs> So, yeah, so you guys are safe, but in my environment, because it's just easier, I have password in here. So shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> okay. So now we've added those two users, and now we're gonna start playing around with permissions for those users. So for our data set profile, so this is data set class, I'm gonna give the data owner update access, because they should have update. And I'm gonna give the storage admin alter access because the storage admin should be able to delete, rename, and do all of those kinds of things. So those are the access permissions that they have to the data set class. And then after that, I'm just gonna kind of list out those permissions. So let's go ahead and we're going to run that. 
Now, on some of these, it's saying it has no effect because the profile already existed, but I wanted the, the example to be universal, so that's why um, I kept the setter in there anyway. So here you can just see this is the profile where we're not allowing anyone to do encryption unless they're a, sto a um, security administrator. Here you can see the profile associated with that data set class resource. And you can see here the actual data key that is associated with the resource. Now you keep going down, eventually you're gonna see our users. The data owner has update access, the storage admin has alter access. Okay, move on to the next step. So now we've protected some data sets. Now the next step is we have to give authorization to the keys. We gave authorization to the data set itself, but when you actually turn on data set encryption, now you have two controls over whether someone can read or write to a data set. So what we wanna do is we want to define a key label, or in our case, a resource to protect a set of key labels. So pretty much any key label that matches this pattern here is gonna be protected by this resource. Now, something about this key label I just want to mention is that this key label, the naming convention was chosen specifically. Um, the way that this key label naming convention was chosen is this first element here, data set, indicates that this is a data set encryption key. So when you see that data set word anywhere in our CKBS, so you're browsing it, you can see all your keys. If it has a data set keyword, I know that it's a data set key because and what, and why that's important is because having a data set key needs to indicate in some way to the administrator that it needs to be administered or managed differently. Data set encryption keys are keys you never want to delete. An application key or a session key, something that's going to go away, maybe after a year or so, if you're not using it, you might decide you want to delete that key. But with the data set key, you can have a data set key that has not been used for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and you still do not want to delete the key. So any automation that you may have on, hey, this key, you know, if it hasn't been used for a year, archive it. If it hasn't been used after it's archived for a year, then automatically delete. You, those should never apply to your data set encryption keys. And so you need some way of being able to differentiate a data set encryption key from your normal application encryption keys. So this isn't enforced, it's just a recommended? It's not recommended. enforced. It's a process. It's something that you would have to come up with. Like you could have um, other, you know, people come up with their own naming conventions. It's just you want some indicator so that you know or the administrator knows. But this is not enforced by ICSF. You can put whatever else. You have 64 characters. You put whatever you want in there. Just make sure you choose something that's meaningful. Um, the other part of this key label is the resource name. So this was chosen specifically because I know that the key that I'm creating are all gonna be protecting that one resource. So this actually, this part from here to here actually matches the data set profile. So even though technically I'm in the CSF keys class, this part here matches the data set profile and that's by design, right? Because if I'm the administrator, I wanna know, well, what key is associated with which data sets? If I caught this key A, that would not be very useful. So you want to think about key label naming conventions as you're doing data set encryption. Now you don't have to use this particular convention, I just wanted to explain that it's important to come up with a convention, whatever that may be for you. Okay, so we defined this resource for CSF keys class, and then we're going to alter it, because what's important is we need to have this SIMC packf wrap, and we need to have SIMC packf ret. And Mark already explained that in his session. You know, RAF gives us the ability from ICSF to take that key out of our in memory. Well, it gives us the ability to take the key that's you know in our key store, unwrap it from a master key, and wrap it under a under a wrapping key, CPACF wrapping key. And the SIM CPACF RET gives you the ability to say, hey, now that we have this special protected key, now we can return that back to an authorized caller. So you need both of these for data set encryption. This gives you protected key, and this one gives you the ability to return that protected key to an authorized caller. Okay, so now we've kind of done that kind of setup stuff. Now we can actually permit someone access to the key so they can actually read and write the data set. So we're doing a permit here for that particular key label or key label type or key label category. Um, in the CSF keys class, and the only person we're going to give access is the data owner. We're not going to give access to the storage admin. That data owner ha has access for read only when they're doing data set encryption. So if this data owner tried to go and use that key in any other callable service with ICSF, it would fail. 
The only reason, the only environment where they are allowed to use the key is when they're doing data set encryption. So here we do a refresh and then we just do a list so you can see kind of what comes out and we'll run this. Okay, so you see here, we have our CSF keys class um, there. We have our resource. Um, you can see our SMTF wrap and RAT, those are enabled. And then we're gonna scroll down and we're gonna see our user in the access list there at the bottom. So you see data owner has read access when they're using data set encryption. Okay. So now at this point, we have, you know, ICSF is all set up. We have generated our key. We added our key to the data set profile. Um, now we've created a couple of users. Those users have access to the data set class. For the data owner, we've given them access to the key, but not the storage admin. So next step, we need to allocate a data set. So we're allocating a data set and it's gonna fit that same pattern. So isha.icsf.encryptme.splat. So we're just gonna create a data set, ends in data, so it fits our pattern, and we're just gonna do a list cat on it after we've allocated it. So this is pretty straightforward. You can see here, it's a non-VSAM data set. You can see the name. Here, there's this new encryption data section, and in that section there, you see data set encryption is turned on. You see the data set key label there, which is the same key label that we created earlier today. So now, at this point, we have an allocated data set. So let's actually play around with it a little bit. Now we're not gonna play around with it from this user ID because this is like our sysadmin, sysprog. We actually wanna play around with it from those two new user IDs that we just created. So we're gonna look at those. So let's look at the data owner. I'm not telling you what the password is. <laughs> I'll make this bigger. Oh, maybe what I should do is encrypt. There we go. That's even better. Okay, so we have encrypt.me, that's the new one, and we have this encrypt.off. So what we'll do, there's nothing in it, so this is a brand new data set. But what I actually do want to do is I actually want to put some ciphertext in there. So I have a script, step 10, which does that. Let's go and edit. Okay, so basically what this does is it just writes hello world, of course. Um, what I end up doing is I have two different data sets. I have encrypt me and I have encrypt off, right? Encrypt me is the one that fits under our data set profile that we created, which has, you know, a key. Encrypt off does not have any profile special protecting it, no key label whatsoever. Um, in this model here, I have encrypt off. So what I'm gonna do is, let's see, split the screen, go back <laughs> over here, that encrypt. And here, I'm going to actually edit, delete, so there's nothing in there, perfect. And then I'm gonna run this. Encrypt off is gonna run against that particular data set. So we're gonna run it on the one that does not have a key associated with it, because I just wanna show you the results, what happens when you have one that's encrypted and one that's not. So we run it against that one. We're gonna go to SDSF, and we're gonna look at that job. We're gonna filter on whatever I called it. I don't know. Let's do filter on me. Awesome. Oh wait, me. Oh no, it's not my user ID, ha ha ha. This is data owner. There we go. <laughs> Let's take a look at the output. So I go all the way down, and what do I see? I see the track, I just did a DSS print, and what do I see? Hello world, right? Because I just wrote hello world, and so I can see it on the track. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna run that again, but instead, we're gonna change the data set. 
So we're going to change this to encrypt me. I always forget what volume this thing is on. I will look. Encrypt SMS VL1. I thought he was like waving at me. He's running from a B, I think. <laughs> That's a very effective way to get my attention. <laughs> okay, so here, volume. Okay, so we have encrypt me, and I've updated the volume on both, and now we're gonna submit this again. And then we're gonna go check out the output. Okay, now it's like buzzing me. That's like if we're speaking so soon. Okay, so go here. Scroll down, and now when we go, we just ran the same exact thing. And what do you see over here? Who knows? What was it? Ciphertext. So what you see over here is you can actually see the ciphertext output. This is showing you what's on the track. Um, and, and whereas normally you would be able to see the words and you may be able to make out the epsidic, you can't at all because this is ciphertext. So let's see what happens if you were the storage admin. So we still have the storage admin, with this super secret password. <laughs> Actually, we're going to make this dot encrypt. So encrypt off, browse, they can see that one. Encrypt me, uh-oh, authorization fail. If I hit number one, you may not use this protected data set. Open ab end. Shucks. And then when you go here to your, <laughs> this thing is like on attack for everybody. <laughs> but if you go to your operator console, now you're going to start seeing messages because you had this storage admin who was trying to access an encrypted data set. Now notice here when you look at the actual um, ICH for that message, make sure everybody at RSM partners knows. By heart. Um, the, you can see the name of the actual key label there, and you can see that it's the CSF keys class. So it's not the data set class that's giving the authorization failure because you already know the storage admin does have access to the data set. It's the key that they don't have access to. And it actually tells you um, who the user was. You can see store Adam there, and you can see that they needed read. They had no access. And you can also see um, the admin come out from DFSMS with a pointer to ICSF saying the key, um, the user does not have access to the key. So that gives you kind of like how to encrypt the data set and also how to check the output. So skipping down here. So I'm guessing the store that can still uh, do what it needs to do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me go ahead and show you that too. That I forgot to show. So let's see. So we looked here. We saw the authorization failure here. Now let's go back to the, the, the storage admin who had authorization fail. Now what if that storage admin then tried to um, rename? So oop, it's fine. Um, what if they tried to delete? It's fine too. So the storage admin can do delete, rename, play around with it. They cannot read or write it at all. So you can't copy it to the page? Hmm? So you can't copy it to the page? Not from DSS print. If you, depending on what level you have to copy it. If you try to copy it and you're at the access method level, you have to have access to the key. If you're trying to copy it at the track level, then you actually um, will only be copying the ciphertext. So thought you, you will definitely read it, get the ciphertext, so you can use it generally. Yes. The, when I'm, I'm not doing an IB gener, when I actually do, let me switch over to you. This is not IB gener, or, or anyway, the, basically what I'm doing is I'm not doing, I'm just doing a DSS print. So that's, I'm not doing like the normal access method access. Okay, but, but I, I thought you can copy it with any copy program now to, to you, some, As long as you have a key. As long as you have access to the key, you cannot, you will not be able to copy. Copy basically involves being able to open the data set and read it. Oh, go ahead. In order to copy the cipher text, you have to use a storage management product, which would support that, like DFTSS or something like that. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, maybe I'm missing the okay. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> I was missing the understanding. What if the storage management group had authority to rename the data set so that it uh, pick up a different uh, encryption plan? Would it pick up a different key, though? <laughs> Basically, at the point that that data set has been allocated, it's stuck with whatever key it has. So it doesn't matter what they rename it to, even if it fits under another data set profile that doesn't have a key doesn't matter because that data set has that key in at allocation. Just a, a terminology question. I prefer the word when the data set is created. Because the word allocate means mm -hmm. different things to different. Yeah. Uh -huh. The BD statement associated with the data set is an allocation. That, that when a data set is physically called into existence at creation time. Yeah, you'll hear different people created or allocated. Yeah. Created. <laughs> okay, so here are some additional resources. There's a wiki page, uh, crypto education community. There's a red book for data set encryption. Um, hopefully this was helpful. The idea was just to show you it really is easy to encrypt a data set. There is a lot of some configuration and things you have to do, but it's very easy and straightforward. So thank you guys for coming. <laughs>